Okay, so welcome to this next video in the playlist on vector spaces. In this video, what we're going to talk about is more fields, basically. Okay, so in the previous video in this playlist on vector spaces, we looked at the definition of a field. Uh, what we're now going to do is have a look at some more examples of fields. Now, in the video on the definition of a field, I gave you three examples of fields, okay, and those were the rational numbers, the real numbers, and the uh, complex numbers. However, those are really, really complicated sets, um, and they're really, really complicated to construct. What we're going to see in this video is some examples of some much, much simpler fields. In fact, these are going to be fields with a finite number of elements in, okay, and we're going to have a look at the prime fields. Okay, right. Uh, so, firstly, what I would like to do then is just remind you of the definition of a field, then we will go through the construction of a prime field. Okay, so firstly, let me just remind you then of the definition of an abstract field. Okay, so an abstract field, which we'll call capital F here, okay, it starts its life off as a set of symbols. Okay, so you firstly start off by creating a great big set of symbols, which can either be finite or infinite. Okay, so that's the fundamental starting point for building any number system, that you have to firstly create your set of symbols. Okay, right, then what we're going to do to this set of symbols is we're going to define on it two composition laws. Okay, now the first of these composition laws is going to be called addition. Okay, uh, and the symbol for this is going to be plus, and you're going to be able to compose any two elements of the field together under this composition law of addition. So we'll have a great big composition table here for addition. Okay, so I'll colour this in. So we'll have addition represented in green here. Okay, like so. And you'll give all of the elements of the field a row in this composition table. So you'll put all of the elements of your set here uh, down here. You'll give every single one a row dedicated just to it. And you'll give all of the elements of the field a column dedicated to it as well. And then what you can do is go through and fill in all of the entries in this great big table uh, and define thus what any element of the field composed with any other element of the field uh, is equal to under this composition of addition. Okay, and uh, we know that the axioms that this addition composition table needs to obey uh, is the axioms of an abelian group. Okay, so addition uh, must obey the axioms of an abelian group. Okay, so what that means is that if you just consider this set of symbols, which is the set of symbols of the field here, with this single composition law of addition on it, then the number system that you'd have created would be classified as an abelian group. Okay, now to turn this abelian group then into a field, what we have to do is put another composition law uh, on top of this one. Okay, so we have to define a second composition law, and this second composition law is called multiplication. Okay, and we'll have multiplication coloured in in orange. So again, what you need to do is create a composition table for this. So I'll draw my composition table here, and the symbol for multiplication of two elements is a times, of course. Uh, and what you'll do once again is you'll fill in all of the elements of the field over here, so you'll give every single element of the field a row in this multiplication composition table here. Okay, and you'll also give every single element of the field a column in this multiplication composition table. So all of the elements of the field will be up here at some point. And then what you can do is go through and define what any element of the field multiplied by any other element of the field is equal to, fill in all of the entries in this great big multiplication composition table, uh, and if this multiplication composition table obeys certain axioms, then we will have created a field. Okay, I'm just going to remind you of the six axioms then that this multiplication composition table must obey in order for your uh, number system that you've created here to actually be considered a field. So let's start over here. So axiom number one then. 
axiom number one is closure, okay? It says, and I'm sorry about the power cut there, it should be fine uh, because my, I'm working on a laptop so it's got a battery, but the lights hopefully will come on at some point, okay? Uh, we've got natural lights so it should be fine. Okay, right, so axiom number one, uh, ah, they're, oh dear, uh, they're going on and off, right. Um, so axiom number one then of multiplication says that if you take any two elements of the field, okay, little x and little y, and you multiply them together, so I'll just put a for all little x and little y are elements of the field, so for all little x and little y are elements of the field, if you multiply x and y together, Okay, and the way that we usually de usually denote two elements multiplied together is we just write them next to each other rather than actually sticking a multiplication symbol in between them. Okay, so x times y here, that answer must be an element of the field. So this is the closure axiom. Okay, and what this means is that all of the entries in this multiplication composition table here must be within the field capital F. So you don't have any answers in here that are outside of the field. You don't just suddenly make up a new symbol and stick it in there as one of the answers. Okay, that's not allowed. All of the answers must be back within the field. So that's a fairly intuitive axiom. And as I say, the name for that, of course, is that multiplication is closed. Ah, there we go. Closure. Okay, right, so there's axiom number one. Okay, now we'll go on to axiom number two. Axiom number two is associativity. Now, this is a complicated property, but we've studied it to death in group theory, so we're used to it by now. Okay, so associativity concerns multiplication of free elements of the field. So for all little x, little y, and little z that you can pick from the field, uh, it must be the case that if we consider the multiplication of three separate things, x multiplied by y multiplied by z, there must be one and only one answer to what that is. Now, when we consider multiplication of three things, obviously we can't just do it with this multiplication table because the multiplication table only tells us how to multiply two things together at once. So if we want to multiply three things together, the way we have to do it is by putting some brackets in here to split it into multiplication of two things at any one time. Okay, but the problem is that there are two ways of putting in brackets. You can either put the brackets around x times y here, which means firstly multiply x and y together, which is something you can do using the multiplication table, take the answer, which by axiom number one is another element of the field, okay, and then multiply that answer by z, and that's another multiplication of just two things, okay, or the other way that you can put the brackets is you can put the brackets around y times z, so this would mean firstly multiply y and z together, take the answer, and then let take x and multiply it by that answer. Okay, and associativity is basically the property. It's the law that says that these two things must be equal to one another, and that's not trivial at all. Okay, if you've just made up the answers in this multiplication table, even if you were closed, okay, so all the answers you put in were from the field, uh, the likelihood that it would obey associativity is very low unless you actually knew what you were doing. Okay, so this is a very complicated property. Okay, but really the gist of it is saying that if you're multiplying three things together, there is one and only one answer to that. It does not matter where you put the brackets to turn it into something that you can actually do with your multiplication table, which just involves the multiplication of two things. Okay, right. Uh, next up, let's do axiom number three then. So multiplication must obey associativity. Next up, axiom number three, and we're at the moment just going through these axioms in exactly the same order as we uh, went through them in group theory, and indeed, uh, this multiplication table must obey quite a few of the axioms of group theory. It is almost a group composition table like addition. Uh, there is going to be one twist in axiom number four, as we'll see. Okay, right, so axiom number three, uh, so axiom number three says that there must exist a multiplicative identity. So there must exist an element which we'll call one, okay, uh, which is an element of your field, uh, such that one can multiply by any other element of the field both way rounds uh, to give that other element of the field back again. So one times x, and this is one of the few places where I will put the multiplication symbol in between the two elements. Okay, one times x must equal x, 
and also the other way around, x times 1 must equal x, and that must be true for absolutely all x that you can possibly think up from your field, capital F. Okay, so that's the condition that there must be an identity element uh, of the uh, uh, field uh, for multiplication. Okay, now there will also be an identity element for our addition composition law, and of course we call the identity element for our addition composition law zero. So two of the elements that you will have here are zero and one. Zero is the additive identity, the identity in this composition table for the abelian group addition composition law, and one is the multiplicative identity, the identity in this multiplication composition law. Okay, right, so that's axiom number three. Now axiom number four, and this is the one which does actually vary from uh, the axioms of group theory, okay, the axioms that this addition composition law must obey, okay, and this concerns multiplicative inverses, okay, so axiom number four says that for all elements of the field, so for all little x that is any element of the field except it can't be one element of the field, and the only element of the field I'm not going to insist that this is true for is the additive identity, zero. So you take any other element of the field, bar zero, and I'm now going to insist that there is a multiplicative inverse for it, okay? Uh, so there must exist some other element, which we'll call x to the power of negative one, or you can call it one over x if you like, uh, which is another element of the field, and this is going to be the multiplicative uh, inverse of x, such that x times x inverse is equal to the multiplicative identity 1, and x inverse times x is equal to the multiplicative identity 1. So you can multiply these two elements either way around, uh, and you'll get the multiplicative identity back again. So there must exist multiplicative inverses for all elements except 0. Okay, and we saw in the previous video when we went through the definition of a field uh, more slowly uh, that you can't have a multiplicative inverse for zero if you're going to insist on distributivity because the instant you insist on distributivity, which we haven't got to yet, it will be axiom number six, uh, the instant you insist on distributivity, zero must multiply by everything to every element of the field to give zero. So there can be no element which zero would multiply to uh, with to give uh, one, basically. Okay, so you quite simply cannot have a multiplicative inverse for the additive identity if you want distributivity to hold, and distributivity is more important than having a multiplicative inverse for the additive identity. Okay, so that's uh, axiom number four, then, of um, th that this multiplication table must obey. Axiom number five is a very nice and simple one, it's commutativity, okay, so it says that for all elements x and y that you pick from the field, it must be the case that if we take x times y, it's equal to y times x. So that's basically saying that this multiplication composition table is symmetric down the diagonal line, it's commutative. Okay, right, so I'll underline that one I think in red, and then one final axiom which is axiom number six and this is distributivity, okay, so this says for all elements, a little x, a little y, a little z that you can pick from the field, uh, it must be the case that if you consider what is x multiplied by the answer to y plus z, that that is the same as x times y plus x times z, okay. So I'll put brackets around here and here. Implicitly, there are brackets around those two. So it's basically saying that you can either firstly add these two together and then multiply, or you can multiply first and then add, okay? So this is the condition that um, multiplication distributes over addition. Okay, and this is the one that links the two composition tables of addition and multiplication together and makes fields very, very interesting, and we use this property all the time in field theory. Okay, right, so those are the axioms then of uh, an abstract field. So now what we're going to begin then is our construction of the prime fields. Okay, but just before we actually do begin our construction of the prime fields, uh, I just want to discuss um, something that we're going to use in our construction of the prime fields. 
So I told you in the previous video that uh, the rationals with the composition law of addition and multiplication on them were a field, the real numbers with the composition laws of addition and multiplication on them were a field, the complex numbers with the um, compositions of addition and multiplication on them were a field. Okay, what about the set of all integers with the composition laws of addition and multiplication on them? Okay, so you do indeed have addition and multiplication defined on the set of all integers. And I'll just remind you what the set of all integers is. It's the set of all whole numbers. So it'll be 0, 1, negative 1, 2, negative 2, 3, negative 3. Okay, and you'll go on and on and on, of course. Okay, so here is the set of all integers. Now, under the composition law of addition, the integers is an abelian group. Okay, so it certainly has an addition composition law on it, which is an abelian group. Okay, uh, so now let's think about the multiplication that we define on top of that. So we can define a multiplication of integers together. And let's think about whether or not it's a field. And the answer is that it's not a field, but let's think about why it's not a field. Okay, Let's have a look at axiom number one. So we must be able to multiply any two elements of the field together to get another element of the field. Well, that wasn't satisfied by the integers and multiplication because indeed, when you do multiply two integers together, you get another integer. When you multiply two whole numbers together, you don't suddenly end up with something that's not a whole number. Okay, so indeed, all of the answers are back within the set. So that one satisfies. So the uh, integers under multiplication is closed. Okay. Axiom number two, associativity is certainly true. We use that all the time. Okay, so associativity is going to hold. Uh, the identity, we've got one which will multiply by any other integer to give that other integer back again. Okay, and here's where it doesn't hold. Axiom number four, that all elements except the additive identity must have a multiplicative inverse. Okay, well, we can quite simply look at two. Okay, look at two here. Does 2 have a multiplicative inverse in the integers? Well, of course, the answer is no. There is no integer that you can multiply 2 by to give 1. Okay, of course, the answer in the rational numbers would be a half, but a half isn't in here. So 2 does not have a multiplicative inverse. And in fact, all numbers except 1 and negative 1 don't have multiplicative uh, inverses in the integers. So it fails axiom number 4 big time, and that is in fact why the integers with addition and multiplication on them uh, is not a field. Okay, right, but let's just make sure that it obeys these final two axioms. 5, commutativity, uh, if we do multiply two integers together, you can do it either way round, and the answer is the same. It does not matter what way round you multiply two integers together, the answer is the same. So commutativity, of course, is true in the integers. And distributivity, we use that all the time as well. So this is also true in uh, the integers as well. So in fact, the integers obeys all of the same axioms as uh, a field, except the fact that it doesn't have this requirement of all elements but the additive identity having a multiplicative inverse. That's where it fails, okay? Uh, so the integers is actually classified as a commutative ring, okay? So that's the fancy name for what the uh, integers actually uh, is. Okay, and the commutative ring obeys all the other axioms of field theory except this one here, okay? But we are going to use this commutative ring of integers in this construction of the prime uh, field. So I feel it's important to just say that uh, this algebraic number system uh, does actually obey a lot of the familiar axioms because we're going to make use of them uh, in our construction of the prime fields. Okay, so that's why I've just pointed out that apart from not having multiplicative inverses, this is uh, very nearly a field, basically. Okay, and does indeed obey uh, a lot of the axioms that we're going to use later on. Okay, right, so let's now construct the prime fields. So firstly, uh, let's start off by giving the name of the prime fields, okay? Let's give them a name before we've even constructed them. Okay, so the prime fields are going to be called this beautiful symbol, this strange F here, like so, where you have two lines. It's kind of like the real numbers where you have those two lines in the R, okay? So you have this strange F, and then you subscript it a little P here, okay? So this is how the prime 
prime fields are denoted. Okay, and this little p can be any prime number you like. Okay, so the little p can be 2, it can be 3, it can be 5, it can be 7, it can be 11, it can be 13, etc. You get the idea. All the prime numbers, the numbers that are only divisible by 1 or themselves. Okay, so you can let p vary over any one of these that you like. And uh, if you use any one of these different primes to make the prime field corresponding to that prime, you'll end up with a different prime field, basically. So for each prime number, there's going to be a corresponding prime field denoted uh, this strange f subscript, that prime. OK, so I'm going to construct it for a general prime, OK, rather than doing it for a specific one. So my arguments are going to apply for absolutely all of the prime numbers, which is, of course, the best way to do this. Right, so how are we going to actually construct these things? Well, the reason I've just been over the definition of a field again is to give us some insight into how we're actually going to go about constructing a field. Okay, and the key thing that we start off with is what? An abelian group. Okay, so let's firstly try and build an abelian group and then let's define multiplication on top of that abelian group and let's hope that it will end up obeying all of these six axioms that the multiplication law must obey. So we're going to start off, I'll repeat it, by trying to construct an abelian group. OK, and before we actually go any further, let me just say that once we've actually constructed this, you will see that this is actually going to have uh, order equal to the prime p. OK, so the number of elements that each of the prime fields is going to have will be that prime that we use to construct it, basically. So f2 will have two elements, f3 will have three elements, f17 will have 17 elements, OK? Right, so let's now begin the construction then. So we're going to start off by trying to construct an abelian group, OK? And the abelian group that we're going to use to build these prime fields is going to be a quotient group of the group of integers, OK? And this is why we spent that little time talking about the integers, uh, modded out or quotiented out by the subgroup PZ. OK, right, so I'm just going to go over uh, this. OK, I'm going to remind you how you actually construct a quotient group of one group by a normal subgroup of that group. OK, so at the moment, we are just thinking about group theory, not field theory or indeed commutative ring theory. OK, we are just thinking about the integers as a group. OK, so we're just thinking about this set here of all whole numbers with the addition composition law defined on it. Forget the multiplication composition law for now. OK, and under addition, the integers is just an abelian group. OK, now what we're going to do is we're going to take the quotient group of that group of integers under addition by this subgroup which is denoted PZ. Now, let me just remind you of what that actually means. So this is the subgroup that consists of all uh, integer multiples of this prime P. So it's going to consist of all things of the form, some integer, integer, little z here, times P. So little z is going to vary over any element of the integers here. OK, so that's the definition of this subgroup PZ, that it's all integer multiples of P. Now, if I write that out a little bit more explicitly, this will be the set that contains, well, let's go through the different integers here. So we'll start off with 0, so we'll get 0 times p, which will just be 0. OK, and of course, we are using the multiplication law here to construct this subgroup. OK, uh, so again, I'm relying on you understanding from classical algebra how to uh, multiply two integers together. OK, so 1 at times p will get p. Negative 1 times p will get uh, negative p. 2 times p will get 2p, and you can go on. Then we'll have negative 2p, 3p, negative 3p, 4p, negative 4p, etc., etc. And this is, in fact, a subgroup of the group of integers under addition. So it's closed. Whenever you add two uh, multiples of p together, you get another multiple of p. It will obey associativity because the larger group obeys associativity. It has the identity element 0 in it, so it will have that. And uh, it also has additive inverses in it. So for any element, you also have the negative of that element, which will be the additive inverse. OK, so indeed, this is a um, subgroup of the group of integers under addition. OK, right. 
Now because we're working in an abelian group, because the group of integers under addition is indeed an abelian group, it's commutative, okay? Uh, all subgroups are normal subgroups because remember in abelian groups uh, conjugation has absolutely no effect whatsoever okay so that means that whenever you conjugate elements of a subgroup by elements of the group you will always end up with that same element back again which is certainly an element of the subgroup so all subgroups are stable under conjugation by uh, the larger group basically okay so uh, that means that this subgroup, PZ, is in fact a normal subgroup of the group of integers. And that means that when we construct uh, the left and right coset partitions of the group of integers under addition under this, um, under this subgroup here, we will get the same answer, basically. The right and left cosets are exactly the same. So there's only one way of partitioning this group up into the cosets of PZ. Okay, so the right cosets and the left cosets are the same. We will just use the notation for left cosets, but we could have used the notation for right cosets. Okay, so remember when we want to construct the quotient group of Z by this subgroup PZ, what you now do is you, uh, you divide up the larger group, you partition up the larger group into cosets of the uh, normal subgroup here, uh, and then the elements of this new quotient group are going to actually be those cosets. And then you can define a addition uh, on this uh, set of cosets, uh, and that's going to be well defined, as we'll see. Okay, right, so let me draw a picture for what we're about to do here. So I'm going to draw a number line, which is the uh, intuitive way of viewing the integers. Okay, so I'm firstly just going to mark on the elements of this subgroup PZ. So here we have 0, here we have P, here we have negative P. So I'm just marking on the multiples of P. Okay, then we'll have 2P over here, and I'm trying to do it as neatly as possible. We'll have negative 2P over here, and of course we could put 3P and negative 3P on, and it would go on forming this beautiful even lattice in this way. Okay, like so. So here is our actual subgroup uh, PZ. Okay, and now what we want to do is we want to partition up the entire number line, the entire set of integers, um, into the cosets of PZ. And we'll use the notation of left cosets, although, as I keep stressing, we could use right cosets. They're exactly the same. Okay, so what we're going to do then is we're going to take all the elements in this subgroup PZ, and we're going to now add on one. So we're going to form uh, the left coset of PZ under the element 1 here. So we're going to now add on 1 to all of these. So we'll then get 1 here, we'll get uh, p plus 1, and this is going to get a bit squashed. Um, and then over here we'll get 2p plus 1, and over here we'll get negative p plus 1, we'll get negative 2p plus 1 over here, and etc. Okay, so this is going to be the set of all elements just to the right of the elements in this subgroup PZ here. Okay, so this is the left coset of the subgroup PZ under the element 1. Okay, and then you can continue on. You can then do the left coset of PZ under 2. Okay, and what will that do? That'll take you onto the next ones along. So let me just mark these on. I won't try and put the annotations this time because otherwise it'll get too crowded. Okay, I'll colour these ones in in orange, I think. So here are the elements of this left coset of PZ under 2 this time. All of the elements of PZ moved to the right by 2 this time. And you'll continue on, so you'll have 3 plus PZ, 4 plus PZ, right up to what will be the final coset that we will need to cover the entire integers. Well, that will be the one where we've shifted everything along by P minus 1. So we'll go all the way along to P minus 1 plus PZ. And when we shifted all of these multiples of PZ along by uh, P minus 1, where will they now be on this number line? Well, they'll be just now to the left of the one ahead of them. So this one will be moved up to here. Okay, so this is 0 plus P minus 1, basically. This one here, which was P, will be moved up to here. So again, now this is uh, um, 2P minus 1 now. Okay, so this is 2P minus 1. Uh, and then this one will be moved up right to the left of 3P up here. 
I'll color these in as I go along. Okay, so here they are. Uh, this one here, negative p, will be moved just to negative 1 here, like so. And negative 2p will be moved up to here, so negative p minus 1 here. Okay, right. Uh, so that then will be our final left coset of pz, and this time it's under the element p minus 1. So here then are all of the left cosets that we can partition up our group of integers into uh, using this um, subgroup pz. Okay, so what we're now going to do then to construct our quotient group of z by pz here is we're going to stick all of these cosets into a set, and that's going to be the set that's going to form our new group, basically. Our new, uh, what we're going to see is going to be an abelian group. Okay, right. Uh, so, we need then a name for all of these left cosets of the subgroup PZ, okay? So we're going to use our old notation from group theory, okay? And a common notation for denoting these uh, cosets, which are also called equivalence classes, is to just take some representative from each one of the cosets and put a bar over it to denote the coset, okay? And we're going to pick clever or uh, simple choices, okay? So if we wanted to do it for pz, say, we wouldn't pick 101 times p, would we? That would be a representative, but it wouldn't be a good choice of a representative. The most obvious choice to pick for the representative of pz is this element 0 here, okay? So we'll call this 0 bar, the coset uh, of the subgroup pz that contains 0 bar, and the subgroup itself is a coset of itself. It's the coset under any element that's actually in it, okay? Uh, so we'll call this 0 bar. Then for this one, 1 plus pz, again we'll pick a sensible choice, and the most sensible choice to pick would be 1 here, okay? So we'll call that the coset that contains 1, so we'll call that 1 bar, okay? And then we'll go on in a similar fashion. So for the coset 2 plus pz, we'll call that 2 bar, the coset that contains 2. And we'll go on and on all the way down until this one will be called the coset that contains p minus 1. So it'll be called p minus 1 bar. Okay, so that's how we're going to uh, notate all of these uh, cosets of the subgroup pz. So we're now going to stick in all of these symbols for the cosets of this subgroup PZ into this new set that I'm constructing here. So I'll have 0 bar there, we'll have 1 bar, 2 bar, and all the way up to P minus 1 bar. Okay, so how many elements have we overall got in there? Okay, what's well going to be P elements, because from 1 bar to p minus 1 bar, we have p minus 1, then when we add on 0 bar here, we have p overall. Okay, so this is looking hopeful, considering the fact that the prime fields, I've already said, are going to have order the prime p. Okay, so we have, in fact, got our set of symbols now. Okay, this is the set of symbols that is going to form our prime field. Okay, so say hello to the symbols. Right, so now what we want to do is put the law of addition on here, okay? And the law of addition uh, comes with this operation of taking the quotient group uh, of the group of integers by this subgroup pz, okay? So there's always uh, a, a composition law that you can put on uh, a quotient group, basically, okay? And in this case, it's going to be the addition one. Okay, right, so I think we'll have a break here, and in the next video we'll firstly start off by looking at the way that we can define addition on here. Okay, and we'll remind ourselves of why that law will be consistent, and we'll go through why it will obey the axioms of an obedient group. And then what we'll do is move on to how we can define multiplication on top of this obedient group of Z by PZ.